Jose. Pointing to the photo, Lyle said to Norma, He's got his hand on my crotch. That was an obscene manipulation. The photo was what any reasonable person would call a happy family portrait. Lyle, in his arrogance, didn't care if Norma believed in his innocence or not. She was just there to be used, to run errands, to operate his illegal phone network, to visit him three and four times a week, year after year. And when she displeased Lyle, he berated her and treated her like a stupid child. Norma wasn't shocked. She'd learned that Lyle didn't care that someone's feelings could be hurt because, as she put it, he doesn't experience those emotions himself. Lyle's megalomania was boundless. He'd tell Norma, everybody who meets me loves me. And he believed he had the jury eating out of his hand. I just come across as this really nice kid, and the DA hasn't produced a single witness to say otherwise. And in this world-class combination of self-aggrandizement and contempt for his dead mother and father, Lyle told Norma, I'm sure the jury are thinking to themselves, how the fuck did this guy get involved with these parents? Now, lest you think that this man-killer is capable only of scaring kindly ladies and wimp journalists, consider this quote from an ex-inmate at the L.A. County Jail who said of Lyle and Eric, We were scared of them in jail, man. I mean, if they could kill their parents, they could take me out, no problem. After nearly five years in jail, the cold malevolence of Lyle Menendez peers out through iron bars and views his upcoming retrial with unabated confidence. I've got half of the people snowed, he says. Now all I have to do is get the other half snowed. Listen carefully to Lyle. He'll play hide-and-seek with you, just as he did with me. But he'll reveal himself suddenly lashing out with claws unsheathed. Then he'll smile and soothe you, just like he does with Norma. It's manipulation for aficionados. Punctilious, cruel, and marbled deliciously with subtle licks of sex. It's ringside, folks, and it's irresistible. The mind of a murderer. On the night of August 20th, 1989, just before 10 p.m., Kitty and Jose Menendez were unwinding after dinner, watching TV in the family room of their Beverly Hills home. It was the maid's night out, and their sons, Lyle, 21, and Eric, 18, were at the movies, so Kitty and Jose were enjoying their solitude. And then they were dead. At 11.47 p.m., Lyle Menendez, wailing and sobbing, called 911. He said he and his brother had just arrived home to find their parents murdered. Before the police got there, Eric called his tennis coach, Mark Heffernan, who agreed to come over immediately from his home in Santa Monica. The police were there in less than five minutes. When ordered by the police, the two young men emerged from the dark and silent house. They were clearly distraught. While the brothers remained outside, watched over by a policeman, other officers entered the house. Both victims had been blasted beyond recognition. The male victim was seated on the couch. The fatal shot had left a huge hole in the back of his head from a close-range shotgun blast. The woman was on the floor, her face half blown away by a shotgun fired against her cheek, arms and legs broken. Detective Les Zoller soon arrived to take charge of the investigation. After 1 a.m., Lyle and Eric, now under control, were transported together in the back of a police car to the nearby Beverly Hills police station, where they were questioned. Eric cried. Lyle spoke matter-of-factly, suggesting that business rivals of his father's might have been responsible. The police did not perform the standard gunshot residue tests on the brothers' hands. After all, they were not suspects. At 2.18 a.m., when the interviews were over, Lyle and Eric left with Mark Heffernan for his home in Santa Monica. By 8 a.m., Lyle was at the Beverly Hills house, asking for permission to retrieve tennis rackets. Detective Zoller refused him admittance to the crime scene. Undeterred, the brothers returned later and received permission to get some tennis gear out of Eric's car, parked in front of the house. 
Unsupervised and equipped with an empty sports bag, Lyle removed several items of evidence, including shotgun shells. In the few days leading up to the funeral, with their father's company picking up hotel expenses, the brothers found accommodations at the Bel Air Hotel, where they ran up an $8,000 bill, including $2,000 in room service. Within a few days of the murders, Lyle and Eric purchased a couple of $1,500 sport coats, three Rolex watches, some money clips, and $14,000 in jewelry. The memorial service was held at the Directors Guild of America on Sunset Boulevard. Lyle and Eric were an hour late. Eric spoke briefly and with emotion. Lyle was very much in control. Three days after the Hollywood service, a more traditional funeral was held at the Princeton University Chapel. The Menendez family had made their home in the Princeton area before moving to California, and Lyle was a student at the university, returning after a year's suspension for cheating. At the Princeton service, Lyle spoke for half an hour and read a letter from his father which said, in part, As we have discussed in the past, we are the heirs to a very special heritage, and with that good fortune comes duty and responsibility. I know that you sometimes worry about your future. I have total trust in both you and Eric and have no concerns about your future and your future role in your country. I urge you, as you go through life and enjoy the fruits of your work, and the good fortune of your heritage to think of your family, your country, and your fellow citizens. I believe that both you and Eric can make a difference. I believe that you will. I encourage you not to select the easy road. I urge you to walk with honor regardless of the consequences and to challenge yourself to excellence. The future does not belong just to the brightest, but also to the more determined. Jose's life was his family and his work. He always pointed out to the boys that they were special, better than everyone else, and not subject to the rules and regulations by which everyone else played. His personal motto had been, lie, cheat, steal, but win. The brothers paid attention to that credo. Lyle's academic problems and unbridled spending caused Jose concern. He was proud of Lyle's success with the opposite sex, but he disapproved of his choice of women. Eric's sexuality was further cause for distress. His mother set a deadline for him to get a girlfriend. Eric met the deadline, but the romance was short-lived. Gradually, Jose became convinced that both sons had criminal tendencies. After warnings from the boy's therapist, Dr. Ozeal, the word sociopath entered Kitty's vocabulary. Prior to the memorial services, the brothers were informed that their father's $5 million life insurance policy, of which they were the beneficiaries, would not go into effect. The estate, rumored to be worth about $14 million, turned out to be overvalued, overmortgaged, and owing over a million dollars in taxes. Their aunt, Marta M. Cano, saw to it that a different policy, valued at $650,000, was promptly paid off half to each brother. Lyle used his portion on a spending spree. At his ease in the back of a limo and followed by bodyguards, he blazed a spending trail across the Princeton area. He bought a Porsche for $64,273 in cash. He bought clothes by the carload, apparently forgetting that he was supposed to be worried about mob-hired killers out to annihilate him. He strolled out of stores laden with purchases. Soon he bought a small Princeton restaurant specializing in chicken wings by placing a down payment of over $300,000 and committed to rent the apartment over it for $2,100 a month. A spacious office suite in Princeton followed, with friends signed on as junior executives at healthy salaries. Not long after, the brothers tried to buy a Marina del Rey penthouse for just under a million dollars, settling for two adjoining apartments when the deal fell through. The brothers did have some worries, though, like when they learned that the store where they had purchased the guns had a video camera monitoring the customers, although it was later discovered that the camera had not been loaded at the time. When they found out that a new will had been started on the computer in their parents' bedroom, Lyle flew to California for one day and hired a computer expert for $150 to erase everything on the computer. The job was done, and Lyle's check bounced. On Halloween 1989, Eric went to see his therapist, L. Jerome Ozeal, telling him that he and Lyle had killed their parents. 
Ozeal called Lyle, who arrived in minutes and began berating Eric. He may also have threatened the doctor. The brothers continued sporadic visits to Dr. Ozeal, who informed them that he had notes and tapes of their meeting in a safe place. He suggested that for their own safety they come to his office and record their version of what had happened and why. On December 11th, 1989, they made the tape which was to haunt them forever. Among other things they later denied, Eric told Dr. Ozeal that the brothers had watched a movie, The Billionaire Boys Club, on TV three weeks before the murders, a movie that paralleled many of their actions. Dr. Ozeal did not turn them in. He did, however, ask his girlfriend, Judalon Smith, to sit in the outer office and listen, and if there was trouble, to call 911. In March 1990, after Dr. Ozeal and Judalon had a parting of the ways, she went to the Beverly Hills Police Department and told the story that made the case against the brothers. Three days after Judalon went to the police, Lyle was pulling out of his driveway in Eric's Jeep when the street to the south was blocked by a police vehicle with light flashing. Lyle threw the jeep into reverse, banging into another police vehicle that had pulled up behind him. He was ordered to lie down in the street where he was handcuffed. Eric was in Israel, playing a tennis tournament when he heard the news. When he arrived at LAX, he was handcuffed and placed in custody by Detective Zoller. I'll give you a call in a little while, so I'm going to let you know that I'm out for the phone. All right, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't let you talk during the visit to Weedy, but at least at least you got to show me your swollen arm. That was, that was exciting. Okay, I'll talk later, bye. Hey, Norma, you should be back momentarily, and I need to have you make a call for me when you do get back, so please stay around, because um, I'm going to keep trying you. That's very important that I, I make this call. Okay, thanks, bye. Collect from, uh, no, actually it's just Lyle. <laughs> Norma, I know you're home, Norma. Unless you and Camille got sidetracked and went to a bar to pick up guys. Nasty girls. Um, all right, I'm just calling to let you know that I'm out. I know it's late and I should have called earlier, but um, I was tied up with Joe on the phone. And I'm still out, and I don't know how long I'll be out, but I'll try you a little later, and maybe we can connect with South Stone, try to reach Marta, you know, and let her know to come at 7 or whatever. Uh, okay? Bye. I'll talk to you later, sweetie. Bye. Norma? Where'd you go? Norma? On June 12, 1990, Norma Novelli, a divorce.